Hello, and welcome to Monumental, where we sit down with entrepreneurs, leaders, visionaries, and big thinkers making monumental change. Here's your host, Evan Holliday. Welcome to Monumental. I'm your host, Evan Holliday, and today on the show, we have on the man, Tim Bratz. Tim, how you doing, man? Dude, doing great. Appreciate you having me, Evan. Appreciate all the value and the content you put out too, man. So excited to be here. Yes. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. So a little background on Tim before we get started. Tim is the CEO and founder of Legacy Wealth Holdings, a real estate investment company that acquires and transforms distressed apartment buildings into high yield assets for their own portfolio. And to date, Tim and his team have built a portfolio of over 3,300 multifamily units in just the last four years. So we, is, we bought a couple more. We're actually up to 3,700, man, 3,738 units as of today. I can't even keep up. The bio can't even keep up. <laughs> I love it. So uh, in working in real estate, Tim has built a passive business and created a residual income that allows him to live the lifestyle of his choice. He's here to educate and empower others to become financially free through commercial real estate. And I love that because that's exactly what we're here um, you know, talking about every day, day in, day out on Monumental. So uh, could not think of a better guest. So Tim, let's, let's just dive right into your background and, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, man. Well, uh, again, I appreciate you having me and I'll give you a, kind of a high level of how I get started. I know that's a lot of how, how a lot of a question that a lot of people always have. Um, so I'm a, I'm a kid from Cleveland, Ohio, originally, and I was going through uh, college when the market was going gangbusters last time, 03 to 07. And um, man, if you had a pulse, you were making money in real estate, right? And so that I was a money motivated kid when I was 20 years old. So I graduated from college in 2007. Um, my brother's out in New York City. I thought you got, and he's like, hey, come and live with me. So I went and moved into New York City. And I thought you got involved in real estate by becoming a real estate agent. So I go get my real estate license and I park it with, um, I decided somehow to park it with a commercial brokerage instead of a residential brokerage. And um, so that was like one of those little minor decisions that you make that put me on this different trajectory, right? And so I, uh, I go and work for this little boutique commercial company. And essentially all we did was we, we did retail leasing and, and office leasing. And then uh, some of the big guys in the office did like some investment sales and stuff. And so, you know, I'm the new kid on the block. I'm 21, 22 years old. And they, uh, they give me these, these dumpy listings, but even the dumpy listings, I like got four, a 400 square foot space in Greenwich village of New York city. And I leased it for $10,000 a month for 400 wow. square feet, 4% annual increases on a 12 year lease term. And dude, you start doing the math on that. And you're like, holy smokes, this landlord's going to make almost 2 million bucks over the next 12 <laughs> years for doing something once. Right. Yeah. And like, I think we all get into uh, um, real estate for that allure of passive income and residual income and mailbox money. But then we get stuck in this like transactional trap or becoming a broker or something like that. And, and um, I realized pretty quickly after doing my first deal, I was on the wrong side of the coin. I need to be owning real estate, not, yeah. not brokering it. So um, after about a year of being in New York, I end up moving down to Charleston, South Carolina and deciding that I want to become a, a real estate investor, but I don't have any money. I'm a punk 23 year old kid, never done a deal. And now it's like 2008, 2009 yeah. and uh, nobody's interested in going to real estate. Right. I just showed up to the party and everybody's leaving and I'm like, oh, where's everybody going? <laughs> and so um, good news is property was cheap. Bad news is nobody wanted to invest or lend on real estate back then. So I had to get creative and I called up my credit card company and I got my, uh, my credit card limit increased to 15 grand. And I found the cheapest house on the entire MLS in Charleston. And I, went and bought it on my credit card, essentially with a balance transfer check. Wow. And uh, I did all the work to it, um, turned it around in less than 120 days and flipped it out and made 14 grand. And I was like, I don't even know what the heck I'm doing. This is the most money I've ever made. And um, I'm going to keep doing it. So, you know, you do that again, you start flipping some houses and uh, then you get into like wholesaling. So I don't know if you're familiar with assigning of contracts and that kind of stuff. And then, um, uh, you know, eventually you meet people who maybe have money, but don't have the knowledge or the expertise or the bandwidth in order to go out and buy real estate. And so um, I met some people and they said, Hey man, let me give you the cash. You go out and do the work and we'll come up with some sort of split. And so um, that's what I ended up doing. I built up a little portfolio, had about 10 units. And when I was 25 years old and I was, was not rich, but I was financially free. All right. Like my monthly income paid for all my operating expenses, all my debt service, 
um, and my lifestyle. And I still had a thousand dollars left over every single month. And um, again, I wasn't rich, but dude, it was financially free, hanging yeah. out, going to the beach, hanging out with buddies. You know, like if I wanted to go to work, I could, if I didn't want to. Now I was more ambitious than that. And so I, I kept doing that. And then, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. So I, I chased this, this shiny object syndrome, right? And um, went down this path of another business that ended up being like a network marketing company. And for about two and a half years, sold off my 10 properties and really believed in this thing. And um, dude, I was on the top 1% of performers and it just, I wasn't making any money, right? I'm making like 25 grand a year. And I was like, I need to get the heck out of this. And uh, I was super broke in 2012. I had 30 or $25,000 of credit card debt and 80 bucks cash to my name. I'm, you know, paying for gas with the coins out of the cup holder of my car. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, dude, intermittent fasting before that was a cool thing to do, right? Like <laughs> you set like the trend, not eating for 18 hours straight, <laughs> buying a foot long sub, having half of it for breakfast or half of it for lunch, half of it for dinner. Like that was my life. Um, and, uh, um, realized like, what the hell am I doing? I need to be like, you know, what always worked real estate. Let's get back into real estate. And I sold my house. It was the only house I still had left. Um, and I had a little bit of equity left in that. So that was able to kind of clean up some of that debt. And I had to move back to Cleveland and move in with my parents at 27 years old. Right. Wow. And then, um, ended up, uh, mo moving into a family house like uh, that my wife's grandparents had for, um, a while. And, and, uh, we lived there for two years, just not small little 900 square foot house. So anyways, I, you know, kind of swallowed my pride and realized I need to like bootstrap this thing again and get my real estate up and running. And, um, uh, raised some private money and partnered up with a couple of guys, built a portfolio of about 140 units in the next three years and um, thought that was cool. And then that partnership foiled and you know, we ended up parting ways and we had to liquidate everything in 2015. Um, and so uh, uh, 2015, 2016. So 2015, I'm starting over again. And um, Dude, it was, it was one of those partnerships where it was like, there was a lot of pressure and a lot of like weight on my shoulders. And as soon as that was off, I was able to kind of spread my wings and go and do a lot of other better stuff and it really opened me up for other opportunities. And so, um, you know, it was a good learning experience while I went through all that stuff. And then I was like, I'm starting over again. Damn it. I'm tired of this being like a recurring theme. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, but again, it opened me up big time. So I got into a deal, I got into another deal, started flipping houses again. <clears throat> was doing about a hundred houses a year. And, uh, I started up a management company and then started building my apartment portfolio. And I remember about three years ago, I sat back and I was like, you know, where am I? I think it was 2017. And I was like, you know, where am I spending my time and where am I building my wealth? And 90% of my wealth had come from apartments and it was only 10% of my time. All my time was stuck in the transaction wow. stuff. I'm like, man, what if I pivoted and yeah. just started spending time on apartments and dedicated my entire team to just apartments. And dude, we just, we blew up and we exploded in a way that uh, gave us massive trajectory. And it's one of those things, man, you make a declaration of the universe comes back full yeah. force. Uh, but sometimes you got to burn the ships and that's what I was willing to do. And I was like, F it, we're either going to make this work or we're going to die trying. Right? <laughs> and it and it ended up working. I think as human beings, a lot of times when your back's against the wall and you got no other options, it's either succeed or die we tend to succeed and uh, you just got to put yourself in that kind of position in order to have that kind of success. And so, um, yeah, over the past four and a half years, uh, built a portfolio, a little over, th um, 3,700 units, we got another 430 closing, uh, next month. So we'll be over 4,000 units. Wow. Um, right now I'm at $308 million of portfolio value. And, uh, and that's cool, right? Like it's cool to say, uh, I went out and bought all this stuff. Uh, there's a lot of people that can go out and buy property though. Like the, what, what I'm really proud of is we only owe 185 million on it. So we have a boatload of equity. Uh, what is that? 125 million bucks of equity um, in this thing. So, and that's, that's all properties purchased during this ups, uptick yeah, upswing. In the economy, right? So everybody's saying that you can't find deals, you can't find deals, dude, I'm buying 400 units, three different uh, properties next month that are all, um, yielding over a nine to nine and a half percent cap rate, you know, once it's stabilized. So I, I buy the kind of stuff that's more distressed, it's more value add, uh, either physically distressed, managerially distressed. We come in, it's, it's usually too big for the, the newbies and, and the younger investors or not younger, but smaller investors to be able to get in there. Um, and it's usually too distressed for hedge funds or REITs to want to buy it. So uh, we kind of 
find that pocket and we're willing to get our hands dirty and do the work. Man, I love it. I love it. Um, so many different directions we could take this right now. Uh, I first just want to kind of reiterate what you said about your story. It, it sounds like you were able to, a couple things, you're able to reinvent yourself multiple times, which I think people lose sight of, you know, they think they pick a path and they go down it and they have to stick with it. And it's like, no, part of the evolution and part of the growth, the personal growth process is figuring out what works best for you and, and being able to make tough decisions and, you know, move to Charleston and move to Cleveland, move into your grandparents' house, mm -hmm. you know, making those tough decisions um, along the way is going to lead you to that growth and, and lead you to where you really should be. And for you, that's doing these larger distressed apartment deals mm -hmm. that took that, that growth process to get there. Um, so I think that's, and fantastic. you're right, man, it's, it's part of the process, right? Like a lot of us are like, Oh yeah. no. And, uh, but it's just, it's a, it's a like your goals are a living, breathing yeah. thing, you know, and, and, and they're always changing. And sometimes the market shifts and you got to be able to be flexible. You got to be able to change with it. And, um, uh, or the opportunities that arise change. And sometimes you got to follow the money. Sometimes you got to follow your heart. Sometimes you got to follow the fun. Sometimes like, it just kind of depends on where you are in your life and in your business. And, um, and what your long-term goals are. But I think, I think the big thing of what you're saying is like figure out what the destination is and then we can reverse engineer the path in order to get there. And sometimes there's a different path that might be a little bit more direct or more scenic or whatever. Yeah. So um, yeah, a couple different ways of going about it. Yeah, I love it. And the other thing I was going to say is I think um, not having, having no ego about anything, you know, being able to kind of, you know, take it on the chin sometimes when you're like, okay, I need to like, learn from this. I need to move in with my parents at 27. Like that's huge. Like a lot of people would be like, man, like they would beat themselves up. They would say, Hey, what am I doing wrong? And, and maybe, maybe you did go through that a little bit, but it, it's just pulling yourself from that and saying, how can I take this to the next level? How can I pivot? How can I grow from this? Um, yeah, I think is, definitely. is phenomenal lesson for all of our monumental listeners. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's one of those things where you definitely, like, like, what are you going to do though? You're just going to yeah. sit on it and you're going to feel bad for yourself. And like, I found that momentum is one of the most powerful forces in the universe, man. Yeah. Like it is unbelievable. And momentum is not about how fast you can go. It's about how little you can slow down, right? It's kind of like running a marathon, right? It's not about how fast you run. It's about how, how much, how little do you slow down and just maintain your pace? And if you can just maintain the pace, all of a sudden momentum starts building yeah. and you don't have to work that much harder, but you're getting these, these, uh, just monumental, right? Just yeah, monumental. there you go. <laughs> but you get these, these monumental, yeah. um, leaps forward in your business and yeah. opportunities that arise, not from, you know, it's not from eating seven apples on Sunday. It's an apple a day that keeps the, the doctor away. You just got it's the consistency over time of just doing the work and putting in the effort of those revenue generating activities, finding deals, finding money, operations, right? And if you're doing those three things, those are the only three things that matter in real estate. Nothing yeah. else matters. It's finding deals, finding money and, uh, and operations. You can do those three things. It doesn't matter if the economy's up, the economy's down, housing Michael's in a tail, <clears throat> the housing markets in a tailspin. Um, Dude, you can go out and do deals. So I'm always, that's, that's what we're focused on, man. We're, we're focused on building the, the deal bucket, fo focused on building the, the, the money bucket and focused on operations and making sure that um, everything stays, stays fluid and occupied and performing uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So um, yeah, man. Where did you learn to focus on that and get super focused on those activities? Like, was that just through the different um, paths that you took along your journey and, and learning along the way? I was bad at real estate for a long time before I got good at it, right? <laughs> so you kind of go through that whole process of, um, but it's not just like, like you got to learn from it. Some people are bad at something and then they don't learn their, their mistake, right? And they yeah. don't learn from it and they go do it again. Dude, that is, you don't want, like every time I'd screw up, I screwed up a lot, but I always learned from it. I always reflected on it. It was like, shit, dude, how do I not do yeah. this again, right? And um, it's like, okay, well, over time, you know, a lot of people, they, they start whatever their endeavor is. Maybe it's real estate. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe it's a, a different type of business selling widgets and they start it and they face these, these struggles and it, it sidetracks them. And they're like, oh, this is too hard. 
So I'm going to go jump into something else. Well, guess what? That, that something else has all those same struggles and the same barriers to entry as yeah. whatever you currently have. And you're never getting ahead. When you, when you pick something and you stick to it, like, like you, you go on this trajectory, this upward trajectory of boom, and then you might get set back. But then you learn from it and you loop around and you don't make that mistake again. And then you get better and better and better and more refined over time. And that way, you know, dude, I used to not walk every single unit when I bought an apartment building. Guess what? I got screwed. Yeah. Because <laughs> somebody, some, yeah. something that the seller said was not congruent with what was actually going on. And um, I got burned, learned my mistake. And now I walk every single unit. You can't pull the wool over my eyes in that. Right. Another time I used to look at, I used to, I remember another building that I bought. I used to look at the rent roll and um and all the leases and say oh it's 80 percent occupied that's great but that does not mean it's economically occupied so guess what now i'm looking at bank statements now i'm looking at sir i'm getting certified financials on collections and all these different things and so again you don't make these mistakes i used to not scope every single plumbing line in all my buildings and you know what was the biggest expense unknown expense whenever i bought an apartment building the friggin plumbing it was always an issue so guess what now we spend two to five thousand dollars per building regardless of us buying it or not but it's a cost that on a building i just bought last month or two months ago um we scoped all the lines found that it was be seventy five thousand dollars of additional plumbing repairs we go back to the seller hey that's that's money that i would have had to come out of pocket spent three grand to go and scope that that comes i go back to the seller hey what's going to happen here oh we'll give you a seventy five thousand dollar credit dude it's amazing, right? I was yeah. seventy two thousand dollars ahead because of that now. Yeah. And um I would I would have made that mistake early on and it would have derailed me, right? But because I made those mistakes and because I stuck with it, like now I don't make those mistakes anymore and you get better and better and better. It's very, yeah. very difficult to pull the wool over your eyes or my eyes because we've done so many deals, right? And so now my deals are more profitable. Now I get more deal flow because I've been in it long term. Yeah. Now it's easier for me to raise money. I got a webinar this afternoon. I'm going to raise 10 million bucks on a single webinar, right? Wow. And it's, and it's like, you couldn't do that early on, right? Early on, I was struggling to raise $300,000 for a single yeah. deal. And now it's like, oh, I need to go raise 10 million. Challenge accepted. Let's rock and roll. Yeah, know? exactly. And we just keep on moving the needle forward. And it's easier and easier and easier to do bigger deals, better deals, um, uh, uh, more quality deals and uh, just if you stick through stick with it right so you just got to not quit yeah and, um, and dude that's I think that's the biggest key to success that's how you really build the momentum yeah I love it and I, I love how you dropped a, a massive value bomb with that uh, scope in the plumbing lines like that alone for anybody buying apartment buildings right now make sure that is part of your due diligence because you're exactly right like I've gotten screwed it was it was smaller it was like a house we bought, but you know, plumbing line was screwed up on that. It, it costs mm -hmm. us 15 grand on a, on a single family house. That's not insignificant. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, the, that is huge value. And then also what you said of like momentum and that, that alone, I think is one of the biggest lessons that people should take away from this episode is like momentum is so key, so key. And James Clear talks about it in his atomic habits. He's like, you know, every day, even on your bad days, put in the work, put in the work, mm -hmm. even if it's just a little bit of work, like just keep moving things forward because it's those off days, those bad days where you still put in the work is where you keep moving things forward. And that's where you gain the momentum. Yep. Again, it's not about, it's not about going and, and working out for two hours every single day. And then, uh, you know, you're traveling. So you take a day off, dude, don't, right? Yeah. Like at least do some push-ups. at least do some dips in your hotel room, at least, you know, uh, do some squats or something like, uh, burpees or whatever yeah. to keep the momentum going. Cause momentum works in two ways, man. It works in your favor and not in your favor, right? You're either growing or you're dying. You're either ripening or you're rotting. And, and, and it's, it's a law of the universe, you know? And so it's, again, it's not about like, I, I was on a run a couple of weeks ago with a buddy of mine who does <clears throat> triathlons and stuff. Dude, I've never run more than like four or five miles in my life. <laughs> and this dude got me to run, um, 42 miles in six days. And we did Dang. five miles day one, then seven, then five, then eight, then 10, and then another seven. And I was like, and, and just on the, on the, while we're running, he's like, yeah, man, the key to marathons. And, and this is where I got that that statement is so profound. It sat with me for the past three weeks and I've been using it over and over again. It's, it's not how fast you run. 
It's about how little you slow down. And, and that is momentum in itself. Yeah. Like it's not about how quickly you can build your portfolio. It's about how consistent you can build it and how you don't stop marketing for deals, how you don't stop talking to investors about money, how you yeah. don't stop refining your operations. You keep on working on those things on a consistent basis. And guess what? It's not a Herculean effort, dude. It's a little bit that you do over time and yeah. it compounds into this snowball that you just couldn't even stop if you wanted to, you know? I love it, man. So, so walk us through uh, burning the ships of, of making that switch from single family to multifamily and, and how you did that and how others could do that. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a, a great, great question. Probably number two question. One is how would I get started? And then two is how do you stop doing whatever you're currently doing that's transactional and get into really building wealth, you know? Yeah. And um, uh, dude, it's, it's, it's one of those things, I think a lot of us build it up in our head. I lo First of all, me, I've never been to a class. I've never <clears> been to a <throat> seminar. I've never read a book on commercial real estate investing. I fell into it. I fell into an eight unit building and it was so cheap, I had to buy it. And then yeah. I realized the scale and, um, you know, the efficiencies and operations and all the different things that came with it. And I was like, that's what I want. I like that, that side of things. And it, it was, it was a school of hard knocks of losing time, losing money and figuring this stuff out, um, over the past, you know, 11 years I've been investing. But, um, I think a lot of us, including myself, look at commercial real estate and we think it's this like unattainable or like way out there kind of a thing where it's like, I didn't, you know, my great granddad didn't come from commercial real estate investing. So I can't, right. you know, or I didn't go to uh, some Ivy league school and study finance and, and real estate. So I can't do this. Or I didn't take the classes and get the, you know, CCIM designation and behind my, behind my name and like all, and, and dude, it's just, it's nonsense. It's BS. There's no reason that you can't just take what you know from residential and roll into commercial. And so, um, you know, I mean, for me, it was, it was that, that epiphany that occurred when I was sitting back reflecting on my goals and my time and like life, you know, I was on vacation. I always review my goals on vacation because you're kind of yeah. more reflective during that time. You're more pensive. And, um, I was like, what do I really want? And I'm like, man, I'm building so much wealth. What if I pivoted? And so for me, it was a no brainer. It was for me, it was, you come back and, um, yeah, the whole, you know, the whole burn the ships, right. We can't retreat. Like, yeah. Uh, whatever it was, the, the Greek soldiers showed up and um, the, the general of, of the, the, the army went and burned the ships when they, when everybody was sleeping the first night and everybody's like, well, what if, what if we're going to, what if we're losing? Well, there's no chance, right? We're yeah. not going to lose because we're going to win this because we, there's no opportunity of retreat. And that's the whole idea and the premise behind burning the ships. And so when I came in on, on that following Monday after that vacation, I went to my, my team, I said, no more single family. That's it. We'll finish what's in the pipeline, but that's it. Yeah. Nick, wow. my acquisitions guy, you're, it's, and it, it was a big mindset shift, but from a functionality standpoint, if you're already doing real estate, it's really just a small pivot. And you're just, instead of looking for single family houses, we started only looking at apartments. You know what happened? Only apartments appeared. The next deal that was an 11 unit that came across our desk that week hmm. that we ended up wholesaling, we made $87,000 on it net right wow. now it covers our operating expenses for a couple of months our overhead yeah and um and now we're able to go find more buildings then i find a 20 unit that we ended up buying then i found a um an 11 unit we ended up buying then i found you know we just kept on growing and growing and growing that way um and we organically grew to a point where now the the balance sheet was big enough where now i could take down an 80 unit building or a 150 unit building and uh and i grew organically i didn't even know that you could find somebody like you to come in and sponsor a deal or um, um anything like that. So, uh, I organically built it. Uh, then I went to my, my project manager. Hey Matt, instead of renovating custom homes and flipping these things, guess what? We're not going to renovate houses. We're going to do a standard finish across all of our apartments and you're going to renovate apartments instead of houses. It's actually easier because you're doing the same thing a yeah. hundred times versus something different a hundred times. Right. Um, so that, and, and you have more efficiencies in, in suppliers and vendors and contractors and everything moves faster and it's just easier. And then, um, and then my, my disposition guy who was selling the houses, I said, Hey man, instead of selling houses, you're going to be managing, uh, asset managing our portfolio. And so it was just a small pivot for every single person on my team. And, um, again, man, it's just, it's one of those things. It's really, really difficult to have the belief and have the faith that the universe will respond to that when you're yeah. going to burn the ships. Uh, but it's happened to me multiple times, right? It happened to me when, when uh, 
Uh, I quit that network marketing company and I left that network mar marketing company and, and decided to go back into real estate. And all of a sudden this investor showed up and we created this partnership, right? And then that partnership fails. And I don't know what, you know, like a door closes, all of a sudden a window opened up, right? And all these other opportunities uh, came in. And then it was like, um, when I was wholesaling houses, I did, I was a, I was a little bit of a, of a, prostitute of, of going and wholesaling houses. I would take any wholesale fee. It didn't matter if it was 500 bucks. I remember doing a deal for $200. It took me a month and a half to close. Wow. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? For, yeah. I did all this work for 200 bucks. And I went to my team and I said, we're only doing deals, $5,000 and greater of wholesale fees. You know what popped up? We didn't even see anything that was under five grand anymore. It was an $8,000 fee. It was a $5,000 fee. It was a $12,000 fee. Yeah. It was a $17,000 fee. And again, it was burning the ships and what you focus on expands. And, um, and that's what's happened over and over and over again in, in my life. And so now we just focus on big apartment buildings, all right? Like people still bring us small deals. And I was like, no, don't even look at it because what we focus on expands. We're going to go do small buildings if you start looking at small buildings. Yeah. When we look at big buildings, Nick, my acquisitions guy, <laughs> then only big buildings are going to pop up. So, um, you know, I think it's, a, I think it's a couple of things. One, all it is, is, is taking single family and adding a couple zeros on like the profit and loss statements are pretty much the same. There's just a few more income sources and there's a few more expenses on apartment buildings. Um, there's definitely some nuances in management and stuff, but it's, it's actually easier than, uh, than managing a hundred single family houses. It's easier to manage a hundred unit apartment building. So knowing that it's easier to get financing, it's easier, right. To, uh, to raise money on bigger deals because people with more money are, are they don't want to do small deals. Um, and then uh, uh, getting it out of your head that, you know, you need some sort of Ivy League education in order to get into, into this stuff. You don't, you don't. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd say the other thing is like, a lot of people focus on the fear of like the what ifs that won't work. Like what if, what if a contractor screws me? What if the plumbing goes out? What if a tenant I have to evict and they ruin the unit? What if, uh, this or that, or like you're focused on the wrong. What ifs like, that shit's going to happen. I promise you it's going to happen. Like, yeah, it's not a what if that's going to happen. Yeah. Right. But what if you got rich, right? What if you built a financial fortress around your family that nothing could ever penetrate? What if you could take, send your kids to any school that, that they wanted to go to? What if you could travel the world and see things and experience cultures that other people only read about in books, right? Or they got to watch national geographic in order to see that kind of stuff. Like you can actually take your family and go and do that. And so that's, like I focus on those what ifs, you know, that is what gets me through all the, all the punches in the gut and all the getting kicked in the crotch and, uh, and all that kind of stuff that comes with the territory. Yeah. You're going to have more, more bad days and mediocre days than good days, but those good days are so good and it sets you up so much for the future that it makes everything else worth it. Yeah. And, and like you said earlier, it's where focus goes, energy flows, it, it's so true because if you're, if you're thinking about these types of deals, if you're thinking about what could happen, what positive impact this could have on your life, then that's where your energy is going to go. And that's where the world is going to get your back and they're going to push you in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that. And, and I think you're exactly right. And that's, that's what we love talking about here on Monumental is really like you can, you can use multifamily investing as a vehicle to get to whatever lifestyle that you so desire for you, your family, for your impact, for making monumental massive change in the world to help others, mm -hmm. to help your residents, to, you know, live your best life. Um, mm -hmm. And you're exactly right. Like you're, you know, you're with these 3,700 units, you're now at a point where you can take your family where you need to go or where you want to go and, you know, live your best life. And so, um, so I applaud you for that, man. No, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think you hit it on the, on the head, like you can't make an impact when you're broke, right? Yeah. Like you can make an impact. You can go build churches and hospitals and, and, yeah. and, uh, uh, full, you know, fun philanthropies of all sorts of different kinds and help out neighbors and help out family members and help, like, you can't do that when you're broke. Like, like I, I think we have a duty to go out and make as much money as we possibly can inside the time that we dedicate towards economics and making money, right? Like yeah. that's not to say neglect your family or neglect your health or neglect your uh, spirit or your mindset or anything like that. It's, it's focusing on, I'm going to dedicate eight hours a day, six hours a day, five hours a day, 10 hours a day to economics and building wealth. And 
Um, I think inside that time, we have a duty and a responsibility to build it up as much, make as much money as we possibly can and uh, build as much wealth as we possibly can because then we can offer greater impact. Yeah, I, I completely agree. That's, that's how we operate within our business as well. And, and I think it, for me, it came from seeing people like Andrew Carnegie and, you know, the titans of industry and, and how, you know, a hundred years ago, they were literally amassing this massive wealth. But he said from like, I think like the age of 30, he said publicly, he's like, I'm making all this money so I can then give it all away. Yep. It's like, I want to have a massive impact on the world. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the same thing, man. Like, um, I know you, I know you get into like some success questions and stuff when you, when you wrap, I'm going to kind of, uh, touch on that now just cause we're on, on the subject. But yeah. like, to me, like, like my company's legacy wealth holdings, right? I have a podcast legacy wealth show. I, my fund is legacy wealth fund. Like everything is legacy wealth to me. Yeah. But to me, it's not about real estate. It's not about property. It's not about, you know, treasure and, and, um, uh, money and passing those things down to me, true legacy is passing down education and teaching other people how to do it yeah. and teaching, you know, through podcasts, through social media, through, um, you know, just local events and, and obviously through my kids and educating them how to do that. Like this, this is not a, a braggadocious type of thing, but I just want to like quantify something for you. Like you can dedicate a season of your life to going out and buying real estate like I have. Right. So I have a $300 million portfolio, not including the other stuff I'm buying. And I own 26% of the overall portfolio on average. Okay. Some of my own hundred percent of some of my own 80, some of my own 15, 20% of right? right on average, I own 26%. So over the next 30 years, that's going to be owned free and clear. And over the next 30 years, it'll probably double in value as well. So if I stopped working today, I have a $600 million portfolio and my net worth is 25%, about 160 million bucks, right? Dude, you think about that. I dedicated four and a half years of my life to building that current portfolio, right? And now it's just, yeah. you don't wait to buy real estate. You buy real estate and wait. Of that 150, 160 million dollars minimum, right? That my net worth will be, I'm not giving any of it to my kids, right? They'll get, they'll get a beach house. And they'll get, they'll get our other house, right? They'll get two houses and that's it. But they're going to get the education on how to go out and do it themselves. And my hope is that my kids are worth a hell of a lot more than that in the next, when they're 35 years old, right? Then, then they're going to say, dad, I don't even need your money. Go get yeah. it away, right? Because that's, that's the imprint I'm trying to make on them um, and on others. So that way we can give all the money away, man. Um, and, uh, and they know that. You know, they, they know that they're not getting any of it. So I mean, they're <laughs> like two and four. So I don't think they'd really understand it. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. I was just so going to ask how old they are. <laughs> not depressed about it yet, but I'm already planting those seeds. Like you're, this is daddy's money. This is daddy's, you know, um, and, uh, uh, you know, you're fortunate cause you get to live in, in, in live in daddy's house, but daddy paid for these toys and these toys are going to go back and we're going to give them to other people. And if you want a new toy, yeah. we got to give away three toys in order for you to get a new one. Right. And, uh, and trying to train them and educate them that way. That's amazing. I love that. Um, so what about quickly dive into uh, how you've been able to, you touched on it earlier, raising $10 million in a webinar. How have you been able to get to that point where now you're, you're fundraising machine? Bro, my back was against the wall about two years ago. And I had raised up to about a million bucks on any given deal. And um, you know, it, was, it was a little bit of work. I, I could get it done, all that kind of stuff. And so I had a buddy who, who sold his, um, his e-commerce business um, about two and a half years ago. And he said, he's like, hey, man, I want to invest in some real estate. Can I lend you some money? So we did a deal where he invested about uh, 200 grand. We did another deal where he invested 450. We did another deal where he invested half a million. And, and he sold his e-com business for like 40 million bucks. And he kept about 30 million of it, I think, something like that. And um, so I knew he had some coin. And, uh, you know, it was easy deal, deal, deal. And we closed a bunch of deals pretty quickly with, uh, with his capital. And, um, it came to a point where I had this big opportunity. I had about five, 600 units at the time and a 700 unit portfolio came across my desk and it was like, dude, we're buying 700 units for 10 million bucks. Uh, but it was pretty distressed. We had to put another wow. dude, almost 20,000 a unit into it. So we're all into it for like 26, $27 million but we're going through the refi right now. And, um, it looks like it's going to praise for around 50 million total, maybe a 52. Wow. So it's like, it was a grand slam deal, right? We're in it. 
I don't know, 55 cents on the dollar. Anyways, great deal. Uh, I shoot this guy a text message. I'm like, hey man, I'm, I'm um, close on this deal, but it's a, you know, I, I had to raise 4 million bucks for it. And uh, I said, do you know anybody who might be interested? Wink, wink, right? And um, he goes, uh, let, me, let me make some calls. Let me see what I can do. And he texts me back like 20 minutes later. He's like, yeah, man, we're good. I said, what, what do you mean we're good? He's like, yeah, I got the money. I said, oh, you do? How, how much? He's like, 4 million, right? You said you need four. I was like, yeah, 4 million. I was like, oh, great. So my role in this whole thing was sponsoring the loan, raising the money, and I do some capital asset management type stuff, right? So that was really all I had to do. So I'm sitting on my hands for the next like three months while my <laughs> partner's doing all the due diligence, hanging out, thinking this is like one of the easiest deals ever. Dude, just getting started, right? So two weeks before closing, he comes to me and he's like, um, or I sent him a message. I'm like, hey man, here's when we need the money in June and first or whatever it was. And I just want you to be ready. He goes, oh, cool. Uh, I don't have it all yet, but I will. I was like, what do you mean? You don't have the yeah. money. He's like, no, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and uh, bring it in from this other business and, da, 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 and all this other stuff. Long story short, dude, he comes to me on, we're closing on a Monday morning. He comes to me on Friday morning before and says, Whoa. I don't have any of the money. Wow. Zero. So now I got, I got 300 grand up hard earnest money and into like due diligence and all that stuff. Yeah. And I'm not in a position where I could lose $300,000, right? A couple of years ago. And so I'm like, Oh dude, like what are your options? I want one. I can, you know, curl up in a ball and, and, and rock back and forth in the fetal position, feeling yeah. bad for myself or you know, I could ask for an extension, but I lose a lot of face if I do that with the broker, with the mortgage broker, with the lender, with all these other people, you know, and um, my business partner. And so my only other option was, dude, roll up the sleeves and get to work. And so, um, dude, I, I made a list. And, and what I found is that, is that a lot of people aren't telling people what they do. I made this long list and I reached out via text message, email, phone calls to like, I don't know, over a hundred people. And who had money, who I invested in real estate, who whatever I, I had met and I had conversations with, and I knew that they had ambitions to invest in real estate, but um, I never really told them about what I did and how I did it and how I structured. And they're like, dude, are you kidding me? This is how you structure your deal. I love it. Like, like I want in on, on a deal, but my money's not going to post. Like I'm selling this property. It's not going to hit until August or I got some money coming in in October or yeah, whatever it was. Yeah. And so I realized one, it's all about timing right? So it doesn't matter if you have the best deal in the whole wide world, you go to your investors and they don't have the cash. Yeah. Or they, they weren't planning for it. Um, they're not gonna be able to fund it. So number one is, dude, you got to plant seeds and let everybody know what you do and how you do it. You're not going to be able to go out like, dude, private money lenders aren't going to come and knock on your door trying to give you money if they don't know what you do. You're like, you're not a super yeah, exactly. agent, right? Like you can't build a business if nobody knows. So I'm always very active. I'm always very vocal about what I do and how I do it and all these different things. I'm telling people that I have relationships with about how I raise money and how I pay money and pay my investors and the kinds of deals that I do. And it's not a secret. And then all of a sudden it just becomes a, a timing piece. How do I get involved? Right? I have a deal closing tomorrow on a build to suit retail space that, um, dude, my, one of my best friends from college, I've known him since I was 20, uh, no, 18 years old. I'm 34 today, right? I've known him for 16 years, coming in for the first time on a deal, right? Wow. Like he's seen me, he's watched me. It's one of those like, what's the, what's the like Jesus couldn't be a, a, a prophet in his own hometown, right? Like he saw me in college and he's like, I'm not investing with this kid, right? <laughs> no chance. I've seen awesome. how much of a clown Tim acts like, right? And all this stuff. And um, took a little bit to build up that credibility yeah. in what I do and everything. And, and um, so now I got, my parents just came in on the first deal also. They're coming in on this deal tomorrow as well. Um, another buddy of mine from, from high school that I've known since I was 10th grade, you know, 16 wow. years old or whatever, just came in on, on a deal. Um, and so it's just, dude, it's planting seeds. You don't know when those seeds are yep. going to sprout. You've got to just tell people and always be educating them. And yep. um, some of those seeds might sprout in, in you know, five weeks, some might sprout in five months, some might be five years, some might be 15 or 50 years, you know, but I can tell you that if you're not planting seeds, you will not get a harvest. Yep. So you got to plant seeds and, um, and then just keep on cultivating those relationships and letting people know. I love that you say plant seeds. Cause I say that all the time, you yeah. know, it's same thing. It's like, you know, you gotta be planting those seeds. Such a good and analogy. You, yeah, it really is. Cause you, you really never know. I mean, you know, these could take years, decades. I mean, the, the 
the conversations you had years ago are, are going to come back around as long as you're putting out value and you're sharing and you're telling people what you're doing. Um, it's going staying to come relevant. back around. Exactly. Like what you're saying, you're staying relevant. You're putting out constant communication yeah. and content and letting people know you're staying top of mind. Um, so that way, like, like, dude, I'm sure every single time you have a podcast that drops, you get somebody that says, Hey man, I'm, I'm interested. I got some cash. I just came into some money or uh, whatever, like, and they want to invest in projects with you. Right. So it happens with social media posts that I put out there. I either get deals I get joint venture partners. I get uh, private money lenders or people who are like, Hey man, can I do you mentor? Do you coach? Do you do anything like that? So it, it fills all those buckets that we were talking about, right? Deals, money, operations. And then I have another one that's, that's my coaching stuff. Um, and I do the coaching because it funnels into those other three buckets. And so it's um, like, that is the highest and best use of your time, of my time, of just educating people and letting them know um, cause we're the fuel that drives the engines of the, of our business. I'm sure you have examples like this as well, but it's amazing. You put yourself out there, uh, and you'll get messages on Instagram or, or whatever social media platform and say, Hey man, like I see what you're doing. I see the value you're adding. I'd love to be a partner. I have a million dollars. I have mm -hmm. X amount and I want to place it in your next deal. And Evan, you got lucky, man. That doesn't happen to just anybody. That just, you, you're a lucky guy. Evan. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's putting in that work every day. It's, it's going to back to that momentum that we talked about earlier. hundred percent, man. It's the harder you work, the luckier you get. Right. Yeah. And you got to keep on planting those seeds. And then again, you're planting all these seeds. They don't all sprout at the same time, but guess what yeah. happens a year down the road, two years down the road, five years down the road, eventually yeah. all of them sprout or majority of them sprout. Yeah. And then it looks like you just got lucky. It looks like you just got, um, uh, just had this opportunity fall in your lap and it's not the case. It's you were yeah. planting seeds and not seeing a return on your time, not seeing a return on your investment, not seeing, you know, the, the, the revenue start rolling in until eventually, you know, time catches up, man. People are, yeah. people are watching you to make sure that you're going to stick with it, right? They're, they're watching you to make sure you're not going to quit and jump yeah. around like you did on your last business, your last job, your last, right? Like they yeah. want to see the commitment from you before they ever make a commitment of money to you. Yeah, exactly. Guys, take this down, write notes, because this is massive value. It really just comes down to planting seeds, you know, being open, talking to people all the time, putting yourself out there. Um, and the, the money will find you once you have the deals, if you're constantly doing that and building momentum around that, that kind of capital raising fun funnel. Well, Tim, I feel like we could keep going and going. Uh, but let's, uh, let's jump into our monumental questions. What does success mean to you? And I know we, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Well, I guess I talked a little bit more about legacy. Um, as far as success goes, like, like there's definitely peace of mind, I think, is success. Happiness, obviously, is success to me. Um, and, and money isn't success, but, but money leads to those things. Like yeah. you definitely have peace of mind when you have money when you especially yeah. when you have residual income and passive income coming in like there's a layer of peace of mind where you know you got a roof over your head you know you got some clothes on your back you know your family's safe um you know you got food in your belly and there's definitely um things that can come from that you know being able to give give and uh, uh contribute and impact because you have money like dude that that feeds the soul yeah and so um that definitely helps uh I heard Jim Rohn say once that like he wanted to reach a level of ambition and content, right? Cause a lot of ambitious people aren't that content and a lot of contented people aren't that ambitious, but if you could reach a level where you're both ambitious and content, like yeah. dude, what a place that must be. Right. And, um, where you're, where you're, and, and I've kind of, I've kind of gotten there, you know, and, and it's like, it's pretty amazing. I'm, uh, there's a couple more deals I want to pop and I want to get a little bit, little bit more liquid and then I'm going to feel really, really good about where I am. I'm going to feel very content, but it's not going to slow me down, right? Like now what feeds me and what drives me and, um, is, is the impact piece, right? And helping as many other people make millions and millions of dollars as, yeah. as possible and, and change their family's financial future. Um, like getting those letters and getting those messages, it's, it's really, really impactful and, and seeing the difference that we can make. And so, um, dude, it's like, Knowledge and, and wealth is like sunshine. There's not a, a limited amount of it. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? Yeah. And um, you getting sunshine doesn't take any sunshine away from me. You making money doesn't take any money away from me. And there's no reason that we can't 
collaborate and work together and probably make more money if we work together versus yeah. compete. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, success is probably reaching that level of ambition and content. I love it. That's awesome. Um, what about daily habits or morning rituals that you have? Dude, I used to have a bunch before I had two, two little kids and, uh, <laughs> and now, I, now I don't as much. Um, like, like I fall asleep in my daughter's bed and then I wake up in the middle of the night and then I knock out work for like three hours in the middle of the night and then I go back to sleep at, you know, 3 a.m. and <laughs> sleep till 6 a.m. or whatever. So nice. um, not as much as I used to. I do keep like a, a daily or like a weekly rhythm register where it, it's like, what are the most impactful activities that I can do in the five pillars of my life, right? Like financial, physical, mental, spiritual, and relational. And so like, making sure I'm home by 4 35 o'clock every single day. So I can yeah. put the phone away and hang out with the kids and my wife. Right. Um, like that is a big activity that, that, that is, I must accomplish for my relationships on a daily basis. Um, you know, just uh, maybe it's, it's really like getting 30, 30 minutes of exercise where I break a sweat. I got to be able to break a sweat. And that to me is like, I got my workout in. If I can run for an hour and a half, amazing. Or if I'm lifting weights and just doing, you know, uh, burpees and stuff for, for 30 minutes, then it is what it is. Um, but at least I'm getting like a 30 minute workout in and I try yeah. to do that four or five days a week. Um, you know, intermittent fasting is actually something that I, that I practice as well. And so I won't eat until noon and then I'll eat up until about 6 PM. And then I don't eat until noon the next day. And that's, you know, keeps my health kind of dialed in and, um, you know, listening to podcasts and listening to, um, audio books and stuff like that. Reading, um, you know, and, and, and figuring out what is that one activity for each one of those different pillars of, of my goals and um, not trying to come up with five or 10 because we're ambitious guys and we, that's what typically we do. And that's what I used to do. And then I'd accomplish none of them. So I'm like, what's the one health thing? What's the one relationship piece? What's the one physical piece? And what, what are the one or two activities from a financial piece that drives yeah. deal flow, money flow? And dude, for me, it's podcast and it's being um, active on social media. Yeah. I love it. Um, so in wrapping up, what about your favorite book or book you're currently reading? Oh man. Um, like right now I'm reading magic of thinking big again by David Schwartz. That's like a, 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 a classic. Um, I like anything by Jim Rohn. Uh, he's, he's amazing. I like reading the, the classical yeah. books like think and grow rich, how to win friends and influence people, magic of thinking big power of positive thinking, um, richest man of Babylon, like, all those, I think, um, I just love that they're, they're time tested. And yeah. a lot of the stuff today is like regurgitated from those things anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you get a different <laughs> angle and you get it a little bit updated by reading some of the more modern books. But I'm always re rereading those, those old classics as well. Yeah, I love that. Um, well, in closing, how can our uh, monumental listeners reach out to you or follow you? Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm real active on Facebook. Follow me at uh, Tim, Tim Bratz at TL Bratz, facebook.com slash TL Bratz or on Instagram um, at Tim Bratz. Um, I have a lot of different free content that I put on my website, which is legacywealthholdings.com. And um, I do a little bit of coaching. I'm not some guru, but I, I partner up with students and I joint venture and I invest in deals and it gets me involved in more projects and gets others involved in projects. So that's called Commercial Empire dot com as well if uh if there's ways that we can make some money together on that front so um yeah man i appreciate you having me this is a, a great dialogue and i love what you're doing and i love your your mindset and um appreciate all the all the value and the content you're putting out there bud thank you man and, and guys if you enjoyed today's episode make sure to tag tim on whatever social media uh tag me let us know you're listening let us know what you got out of today's episode and also make sure to take Tim up on everything, all the value he's bringing with Legacy Wealth, with Commercial Empire. Um, and guys, with that, have a monumental day. Mm -hmm.